is it possible to make passionate love to someone who you've been with for 5, 10, 15, 20 years or more? Is it possible to overcome some of the biggest sexual traumas that you've had in your life, starting from early childhood, and still have rewarding, exciting, fulfilling sex life? That's what we're talking about on today's episode of the Strength of Seduction podcast. Hey, Strength of Seduction family. This is Daniel, and if you're listening to this episode, well, there's a good chance that you're already a Strength of Seduction customer. Um, the reality is most people purchased our Strength of Seduction workouts back during the pandemic because they were really fun to do in the house, and they looked exciting, and you wanted to build intimacy with your partner. You wanted to build connection with your partner. But over the past few years, we've realized that just doing the workouts is really fun, it's engaging, and it's interesting, but it's not really what we were trying to get at with our programming. What we intended to do is to create something that would help you to transform your life and your marriage. And it's taken us a few years to figure out what exactly that means. And we didn't do it alone. We did it by talking to you. Over the past few years, we've talked to over 20,000 couples, black couples in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s, who've gone through it all, who've seen the ups and downs of life, who've gone through all the struggles, who've actually achieved happiness. And what we learned was really shocking. We learned that there are four key elements that all relationships must have strong. They must have on lock in order to make that relationship thrive. And we took those four elements and we designed a program around those elements to help support black couples in a way that's, well, we've just never seen done before. And what we came up with was called Love and Legacy. And it's the first and only program in the world created from speaking privately with thousands of couples just like us about the biggest challenges in our life and relationship. And it's actually a proven system designed to help black couples upgrade our life and our marriage. Now, this is not open to the public yet. Uh, If you're listening to this, like I said, you're most likely already a member of our community. And that's why we'd like to tell you about it first. You can apply and you can learn more at strengthofseduction.com forward slash legacy. This is a private page. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you because the reality is there isn't a lot of talk about what makes our marriages work, what makes our marriages thrive. What I've seen when I'm doing my research is that there's still a big stereotype that our marriages don't last, they don't work, (laughs) that they're non-existent. And that's certainly not the case. In the Love and Legacy community, we have members who've been married for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're still going strong. And yet they're still interested in learning more and digging deeper and showing up better as partners and individuals. So if that's you, Go ahead and check us out, strengthofseduction.com forward slash legacy to learn more about this new program that we're launching and uh, enjoy today's episode. This is the Strength of Seduction podcast, the number one resource for black couples who want to build intimacy, love, and connection in their relationship. I'm your host, Daniel DiPiazza. My friends, welcome back to the Strength of Seduction podcast, the number one resource for black couples who want to build love, intimacy, and connection in their marriage. I'm your host, Daniel DiPiazza. Now, if you're new here, you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for updates. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast platform like Apple or Spotify, make sure to subscribe and leave a review. Every review counts. We have an incredible episode for you today on sex and intimacy in your marriage, specifically on some really juicy topics. The, the thing I've been thinking about the most is, especially as my marriage is now going, well, past 15 years, going into 20 years, I think, how is it possible for couples to continue to have fun and exciting sex lives throughout the decades that they've been married? And how, how can couples move past really deep types of sexual trauma that are, are going on in all relationships that people are dealing with uh, from their early childhood and affect both partners as the relationship develops? This is something that is really personally interesting to me, and I know that many people are thinking about it and dealing with it in their own personal relationship. So I wanted to have the opportunity to share an interview that I did years ago with a friend of mine uh, named Layla Martin. Now, I've been doing podcasts, podcasting for years on different platforms, and uh, I have actually many, many episodes in my archive that over the next coming months and years, I will share with you on this show. And Layla is not a, a black person. I don't really think that matters. This is a show specifically designed for black couples. Um, but I always like to bring in the best guests who have the uh, the ability to help you solve your problems, whether they're black, white, Asian, or alien. You know, that's my job. Of course, we focus on the black couple, but if I have good information, I'm going to bring it to you. So enjoy this episode with Layla. And 
while you're here, I want to let you know that we have a great opportunity for you. This is something that's brand new. It's actually something that Strength of Selection has been working on behind the scenes for quite a while. And essentially, we're looking for couples, black married couples like you, who are ready to grow. And when I say grow, I mean mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually together. And we're doing this. We're helping couples to do this through a program called Love and Legacy. This is our breakthrough coaching program, specifically designed for black married couples who want to build stronger communication, who want to build better health, deeper intimacy, and create more money in their marriage. So if that's you, I highly encourage you to learn more about this program. Uh, you can go to strengthofseduction.com forward slash apply to watch a short video on it and learn more and to see if you're a good fit. Now, let's get into the episode today with Layla Barton. Oh, we are on. Guys, welcome back to the show. And today, my guest is Layla Martin. And Layla, where, we met at Craig Clemens, didn't we? Yes. We met at one of these very stereotypical LA house parties in the summer. And Layla, this wonderful woman, was having a discussion that made everyone both tantalized and a little bit uncomfortable because, as in American culture, one of the things that's most taboo is the conversation around sex. And Layla is an expert in, well, a lot of things, but eroticism, sexual health, relationships, reclaiming your sexual power, and pretty much everything in between. If you sign up to her email newsletter, which it's just LaylaMartin.com, right? Yes. Okay. If you sign up to her email newsletter, you're going to get a ton of really cool stuff. Her email newsletter and her YouTube videos are a wealth of information. I know that I know I'm supposed to promote it at the end, but I just want to say her shit's awesome. And today I wanted to bring her to you so that we can have a conversation that we just don't normally have. And so Layla, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome so much. <laughs> so we're both in Venice right now. I saw someone in the, I saw someone in the grocery store the other day. And she was wearing a shirt and it said Venice, where art meets crime. I saw someone with a t-shirt at Erewhon, our local like super chic grocery store that said, <laughs> looking for my soulmate. And then I got into a, a conversation with my partner, whether that was a good t-shirt or not. And I was like, actually it is. Cause if that dude was my soulmate, like if I had the hots for him, that shirt would give me the confidence to go up and be like, I think we should talk. Oh, it was a guy who had that shirt on. It was a guy wearing a shirt. It was like a, it was like a scruffy guy who looked like maybe <laughs> he was like an audio editor or something that looked a lot of like like late night was wearing that shirt and I was like I think that's great I love how you assigned a profession to him which is probably accurate though <laughs> it probably was. It looks like he was either he either works at Trader Joe's or he's an audio engineer <laughs> yeah. so Layla I just wanted to start off by saying I'm really impressed by your work because what you do takes a lot of honesty and candor and I know that it wasn't always like that for you how did you get into this field that you're in now just give us a little bit of background yeah. So I always was a little bit strange in my like desires and inclinations. I, when I was 14, I told my parents, I was like, you guys got to send me to Asia or something. I'm feeling a little bit crazy in these Colorado suburbs. <laughs> nobody understands me here and I am about to lose my mind. And they were like, look, if you get straight A's, you can do whatever you want. So I went to Tibet, India and Nepal when I was 15 and with a travel group of other 20 year olds, which seemed like really responsible at the time. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> you guys sent a bunch of teenagers with two 20 year olds all the way to Tibet. And, and that really opened my eyes to, to meditation, to Asian spirituality, to all kinds of adventurous, big, wide like wild things going out in the world. So I always was inclined in that direction. And when I went to university, I went to Stanford, I had really focused on getting into an elite university because I felt like I wanted to have amazing life-changing discussions about the world. Like I really wanted to sh see shifts in society, shifts in the way people lived their lives. I really got the human potential. And there was much less of that at university than I had hoped. Some of it was me and my own issues, and some of it was just a stiff social system. And so I basically did two quarters at university and bought a one-way ticket to Thailand because I had already been to Asia, so I had this idea. And I spent two years there, and that just changed my outlook. I got into Tantra, so I went to India and found the original books on, or some of my original books on Tantra, the ones that I read. And I felt like I was onto something that I had sniffed out that the way that people lived and the way that they had sex and the way that they inhabited their bodies was not the full spectrum that was possible to us. And so I was learning more and more. And by the time I went back to university, I was like, all right, this is what I'm doing. Like I want to do sex education and I want to understand how to fundamentally transform the way that we have sex. But is that something that 
that Stanford was open to, or did you have to edge your way in there and convince people that it was something worth learning and talking about? Yeah, no, they weren't They weren't super receptive, especially to yeah. my more out there ideas. Yeah. I, I remember I did a project on like the science of yoga, and that was, and this is 12 years ago, and that was revolutionary even back then. It, things have changed a lot in the last 10 years, especially around the acceptance of meditation, the acceptance even of yoga as being an actual system that can help improve people's lives. But even back then, it was a little bit more akin to witchcraft. So it was so weird. Crazy. It was weird. It was crazy. I remember a professor coming in and being like, meditation is just sleeping and everyone needs more sleep. So <laughs> that's basically why people meditate. And I was like, dude, that is that. No, that's not cool. cool. And then in the sexuality classes, which was my focus in the department, it was a lot around people lose their virginity at 16.4 years of age. And these are the following ways that you can get herpes. And this is how pregnancy can go wrong. And I was like, oh man, this is, and the irony of sitting in a stiff chair, like looking at a PowerPoint and learning about sex was not lost on me. I was like, where's the hands-on action? Like in a biology class, you dissect a rat, but like nobody (laughs) here is going to do anything like hands-on or experiential around sex. So I appreciated the education. I am grateful for understanding neurobiology and things about psychology and things like that. But I really was hungry. I was like, I want to know how someone gets to have an epic life-changing orgasm. I want to know how people heal sexual trauma from the inside out. I want to know if it is possible to make passionate love to someone that you've been with for five, 10 years, 20 years. And I don't feel like the answers are here in academia. So I went back to Asia for another seven years and basically worked with Tantra teachers for a really long time to get the answers to those questions. Yeah. And I think back on my own experiences now around sexual education and man, what a, the only thing I can say is just stilted and gross. I think about uh, my first time doing sex ed was third grade and they, we had to sign a waiver first. Our parents had to say it was okay to talk about this. And then we went in there and it was just like, I think it was the assistant principal who came in and you're right. She just had slides and she was like, this is a penis. And like, it it was very clinical. There was no talk of love involved. There was no discussion of pleasure. It was very scientific. It was very, and it was very disease focused. Exactly. And what's so messed up about that is that your earliest imprinting around sexuality stays with you super strong. So there's this great book, Come As You Are, that has a lot of great research on sexuality that's coming out right now. And I'll give you like a very shortened version of this. But if you spray a rat with a lemon scented spray and a male rat goes and has sex with that rat, he will always get turned on by lemon scented rats for the rest of his life. And he will always prefer (laughs) lemon scented rats. So the (laughs) earliest exposure to sexuality matters and it leaves a deep imprint inside of us, an emotional imprint. And so when we, our first exposure to sex is stiff and scientific and clinical. And for most of us scary, because for me, I did sex education in Peachtree City, Georgia. And I remember like huge photos of like penises with syphilis and vulvas, like diseases and stuff like that. It scares you and you associate that feeling with sexuality and there, it's no accident that people still get uncomfortable. It's 2017, and it is uncomfortable for people to talk about sex. And even if people are comfortable talking about sex, it's uncomfortable for them to talk about orgasm and getting wet and ejaculation. Like even the specifics of sexuality still give people like a queasy, weird feeling. That's not an accident. Yeah, totally. And I think that part of it is a cultural thing too. I look at all the. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but I think about all the things happening in like the political arena. And a lot of it's tied to shame around sex. Like, oh, this person had sex with that person. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I really don't care. You know, totally. you go if, have yeah. a good time. As long as it's consenting, have a good time. Exactly. And it, so it's really interesting too. And I, one of my, I'm now thinking one of my best friends, his mom that was a doctor and she was going through med school at the time when we were kids. And she would make us sit down and look at pictures of like diseased genitals and be like, this could happen to you. And it, there was some sort of, there was a loving intent behind it, but it, that wasn't a very good way to do it. Totally, because it's so unbalanced. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't teach kids about STDs, absolutely. But why not spend like a month teaching kids about pleasure and how beautiful their bodies are and the joy of falling in love and like all the reasons that people love sex so much and then give them a good, honest conversation about how to stay safe. And these are third graders. They're not getting STDs. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing too. There's, there's first, there's like the complete hesitation to ever talk about it. And then when we do talk about it, it's just like, 
watch out, <laughs> you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, so totally. then, then what's the, so when, I guess my question would be like, assuming that a lot of us have gone through this kind of very sterile education around sex, when and how should we begin to open up our journey and to start thinking more critically about these really important issues? And, and where do we start? Yeah, conversations are usually some of the best places where like people really start off. So like Esther Perel's starting some really great conversations. We're starting to have some better conversations out in the world around it, but it's still difficult to find. Some really good sex positive books, Sex at Dawn comes to mind, Come As You Are, like I suggested. Some of the books on Tantra can be enlightening or opening for people. And then beyond just opening the conversation, I think what's unique about what I do in my work is I am hands-on. I am not personally hands-on, but I encourage everybody to actually do the practices that will shift them like in a nervous system level away from guilt and shame and fear and replace that with celebration and ecstasy and joy and connection and all those things. So I think just having the conversation is a really first step because people are like, oh yeah, no, that makes so much sense. And I think where a lot of people, a lot of young people really feel is they don't feel like sex is dirty. Like they understand that sex is amazing. They understand that sex is a crucial part of our life, but because they were raised in a sex repressed society, there's this feeling of, yeah, but deep down inside, like my stomach still contracts, or I still don't feel like I can fully be free or fully be myself in the bedroom, or I have a hard time telling my lover what it is that I really want. And a lot of that is because that conditioning goes so much deeper than the mind. So beyond having a conversation, the next step to me is actually using tools and practices to transform how your body is imprinted around sexuality. And so there are very specific tools. It's not like an abstract thing. I use things like focus. So meditating during self-pleasuring or during sex. Breath work is really powerful for being able to transform some of these emotional feelings and attachments and release them and replace them with something else. Sounding is really key. And then there's also practices like even doing strength building, like just the way that if you go and exercise, you have a different relationship to your body. There's actual like sex building exercises or enhancing exercises for your pelvis, for your genitals, things like that, that just give you this more empowered, healthy relationship to that part of your body. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think also for many people listening who are entrepreneurs, and of course, there's now this wave of understanding that we have to improve many areas of our lives in order to see the changes we want in our business. We know that when we focus on learning, when we focus on improving our physical health and our psychological health, that the, the obvious physical benefits come from monetary gain and all that stuff. And it's obvious that there's this benefit around improving ourselves. But then when it comes to sex, we're like, I don't know what to do. And I think part of it is that we don't, we don't make it into a regular practice. It becomes something where it's like, oh, only weird people do Tantra, but that's just not true. And 20 years ago, only weird people did yoga. So there is a social change that's happening. 50 years ago, running was weird. So only yeah, weirdos like worked true. out and went running and stuff like that. Society changes pretty quickly once people recognize the benefits to practices that they used to think were strange. <laughs> I think some of the most immediate benefits that I recognize because I run a team and a business is I feel actually really creative and energized when I'm having deeply connected sex. There is something enlivening, awakening, empowering about it. A lot of people relate to sex as like, I want to experience pleasure and then move on, or I want to really stress and move on. And that's the most that they get out of it. And sex and even masturbation can be this whole space for creativity, for feeling energized, for feeling super, super alive. And it's a whole new way of being in your body, which is actually, in my experience over and over again, a key to great leadership, a key to just feeling really good and confident in life. And it's a key in my experience, doing these sexual practices to seeing the world in a different way. So for those of you who meditate or do yoga and you're like, yes, that shift in perspective and that shift in relationship to myself makes me better at running my business. It makes me more creative. It makes me more insightful. It makes me more connected. It's the exact same thing, but I would say even amplified when you do sexual practices. That makes complete sense. I was laughing too as you were talking because I was thinking about how, how our mindset on things that now seem normal 
were once so different. You look at a movie like Anchorman, where he's like, I'm going, I believe it's called jogging. It's a new thing. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. And it's so true. I was reading Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, has a book where he basically invented jogging because people weren't doing it. And now they are. And there's this whole other side of our lives that we can access when we are able to understand that like, sex is just part of our nature. And if we shut that part down, then we lose part of ourselves. Right? Absolutely. And I think something that's so important for the conversation right now is because our culture is very puritanical with sex, we only know two ways to do sex. One is like pornographic, full-on, exploitive, like just over the top or completely repressed. So right now for a lot of business leaders, I feel because the sexual harassment is now this big conversation and Huge. people are finally talking about the abuse of power that happens in the workplace, what's being taught and talked about is this repression. Like I heard one commentator go on CNN and she was basically like, look, like what needs to happen is men need to learn to desexualize women. And I was like, okay, Ain't nobody knows how to desexualize anybody. If you're attracted to someone, you're attracted to someone. This isn't about repressing who you are or repressing how you feel. It's about having a truly empowered relationship to your sexuality and being mature and knowing how to treat people like human beings and knowing how to feel confident and charismatic and allow yourself to have a sexuality that's integrated, that's beautiful, that's vibrant. People need that to feel powerful in their lives. People who are sexually disconnected, you can feel it in them. They do not feel very powerful. They do not feel very alive. So it's important that we learn as business leaders how to keep our sexuality vibrant and be really mature and evolved about it. It's totally possible to have this. It's not that hard. Okay. Now I did want to ask you about this and I didn't know if I wanted to steer it here because I think it's, it's something that's relevant right now, but I've been thinking about this a lot recently. Obviously, if you're listening and you're in the U S especially, you've heard about the whole Harvey Weinstein thing and all these crazy allegations, which honestly, most likely are true. They just wouldn't be there if they most likely, a lot of them were true. And I'm just wondering like what I think about someone like that. And I think about a situation where you're just blatantly abusing these women in, in such a way. And I think what causes that type of shift where someone feels the need to violently sexually abuse? abuse people. And is that an element of a personal uh, a failing or shortcoming? Or is that something that's, uh, there's a bigger issue at hand? I think this conversation is so important for men and women, but especially for men to be having with each other. Because the thing about Harvey Weinstein is these reports go back to his earliest time in the business to the earliest 80, like the early 80s. So it's not like he suddenly got really powerful and big and then decided to abuse women. It's been there all along. And that man could get laid. Like totally. he had a gorgeous wife. There are so many women in Los Angeles that would have sex with Harvey Weinstein because that's who he was. So this behavior is there's something in it about a twist of power, a kind of sick, unintegrated part, unhealed part of him. And honestly, if you take out the damage that he's done, I can have compassion for that part of him. And one of the things about society is if you have a part of your sexuality, that's like that, we don't have a space where we can have a conversation about it. I imagine if we had a much more evolved sexual society and people could say, look, if you start having some sort of sick fantasy or feel like you're going to do something that's going to hurt someone, go talk to these people. Let's work it out. It's that's mind blowing for our society, but it would make a lot of sense. And the reason it's so important is because in this conversation, I feel like men worry about their own sexuality. And there's so many good men out there that don't ever want to hurt women that like, don't ever want to cause that kind of pain and abuse of power, but they need to understand that there are many men who do. So this isn't a referendum on men's sexuality or men in power. It really is about, let's have a conversation that some people have this kind of shadowy twist to their sexuality where they'll do a lot of harm to others and not make that about men's sexuality in general. And also figure out how do the good men stop that? Because they didn't speak up either. That's a really good point. And I see I see this being played out not just in, in real life, unfortunately, but then also in our in our fictional stuff and in, in our art. There's a new show out right now which is based on a book called Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale? Yeah. Uh, have you been watching it or do you, you know about it? I read the book. Okay, so you read the book, so you're up on it. And for anyone who hasn't read the book or hasn't seen the new series out, and I haven't read the book, but it's by Margaret Atwood, I believe. And the idea is that this is, a, this is a dystopian society, and a lot of it's based on this strange, twisted sexual repression where women are being essentially farmed and enslaved. And it's like 
Now, I know that Margaret Atwood wrote that, and it's a woman who wrote the book, but I feel like there is a part of that's like acting out or playing out this like weird fantasy because we're trying to expel it. I don't know what's mm. going on there, and I'm wondering why. I'm wondering why these things are so fascinating to us. It's almost like we're drawn to some of that dark energy. Yeah, and I think all of us, everyone has a dark side to their sexuality or a shadow side to their sexuality. It's about making it conscious. It's about knowing how to make a space for that in your life, or some other consenting adult, or you just by yourself want to play. And it doesn't hurt anybody else. There's, I just feel like we're so far behind in the evolution in this conversation that people don't have anywhere to go when they have these issues. And so they end up hurting people versus being able to play it out or get into the BDSM community or whatever it is. I'm not saying that BDSM people are always have dark issues or whatever, but there's a conscious, healthy way to learn to play out your fantasies and your desires that end up actually being empowering rather than hurtful to others. Yeah, it's interesting. And one thing I like about how you're talking about this, and you can see it in your videos when you watch them on YouTube or just in your writing, there's a certain way that you, that you're, and you're very careful about your language and talk in terms of making a space for things, in terms of creating, just creating a very clear mental picture of what you're trying to communicate. And I think that now even listening to you, we don't even really use the correct language in describing sex. It's always like fucking or smashing, especially men. It's very, it's very different than, than the way that you're speaking. Yeah, definitely. And part of that as well is I feel women have gone through this whole empowerment journey and they have recreated what it means to be a woman on the leading edge. And that's been a big part of women creating their own businesses, leading other women and creating this new model that is breaking the boxes of the past and being like, look, you do not shove me into a tiny little box as a woman. I get to be all facets of myself. And that's what I'm claiming as part of my empowerment. And the thing with men is they have been given the same type tiny, tiny ass box. I'm getting used to being able to swear on your podcast. I like it. You usually have to filter yourself. So they've been given that same tiny box and some of them are starting to break out of it, but men get so many conflicting messages about sexuality and what it means to be a man sexually and things like that. Everything conflicting from you should want to have sex with everything that moves to if you want to be an amazing husband and father and public figure, you better only ever be with one woman for the rest of your life. And to yeah. you should always give your partner an orgasm right on cue yeah. and last just the right amount of time. Yeah. And she better be super sexually satisfied to like, you should not give a shit about your party. Like you should just be hard and rough and crazy and take what you like. It's really so conflicting. All and there things. is yeah. all those things. And it's, what does it really mean to be an empowered man sexually? I would love to hear and see more men identifying that, embodying that, living that. I've got my own ideas and I'd also love to see more of this conversation and evolution happening because it's so needed for the future right now. If you look at who is leading men in the world, it's, oh my God, we need men who uh, really are integrated sexually. Yeah, grab her by the pussy. It's like, totally. So this really begs the question, how do you take some, how do you take all these conflicting messages? And, and I'm obviously speaking from a male perspective, that's where I'm coming from. And how do you take those messages integrate them and then roll those into a practice where you can have a long-term relationship that's still satisfying while exciting at the same time. I know it's not, it's a lot to, to explain that, but certainly a valuable question. Totally. I do lots of practices with men that help this be a real thing. I'll give you an example of one clear practice because usually people are like, like, how would you do this? It's a practice I developed. I call it fuck kill to consciousness. <laughs> and basically what I do is I have men, this is in, a, in an online course, but they have a stack of pillows to the left, a stack of pillows to the right. And you've heard the thing that like men have this wiring that they either want to like fuck it or kill it. That's the sort of impulse. And so uh, the men get out this impulse to kill, like they just go crazy on the pillows and totally let it all out. And then on the other pillows, they get out the fuck impulse. So it's whatever with your pelvis, like just going for it. And then in the center, I have them meditate. So I feel like in 
in a very deep way, men also get this messaging that you either get to have your impulses, your raw instincts and your impulses, but then you're a bad person or you're going to hurt people or you're going to do all of this, or you get to be really controlled and contained, but then you're not really that happy or fulfilled in life. And so I think there is a different way of being for a man where you get to have that raw sexual impulse and your lovers, they actually crave that from you. If you, if they love you and they're interested, interested in you and it's consensual, like they're hungry for that kind of impulsive, instinctual sexuality. And the same, like men are evolving beyond being killers, but every man has that within him to protect his home and family and to be fierce inside of his own body. And so I feel like we're coming to this place where it's like they can own these deep primal instincts within them and be conscious and present and make incredible decisions internally. And rather than just talking about it, like I construct exercises so they can realize that experience inside of their own bodies, which is really powerful. And then beyond that evolving sexually to be so much more sensitized, connected. One of the huge things that's happened in men's sexuality is every single time that you orgasm or experience sexual pleasure, you're basically wiring your body to experience sex that way. And a hundred years ago, and for all of history before that, a man would only be having sexual experiences with his own body or actual other human beings. So the impact of pornography, and I'm not here to shame it or say it's good or bad, but it has definitely impacted men on a biological level and wired their sexuality. So what I see is when men counteract that with sexual meditation practices, with conscious masturbation, with all kinds of different practices, I've seen men just brought to tears about what actually is possible in their bodies, like what they're capable of feeling, how they're capable of connecting. And it's not just about sweet Hollywood sex that's like really connected all the time although that can be a part of it, it's really about this conscious presence inside of you, no matter what it is that you're doing and a human connection to your partner, not a dehumanizing kind of behavior. Does porn dehumanize that connection? It does because it's not a, you're not dealing with a real human being. So your body over and over again is connecting to an image and that's exactly what dehumanizing is making anything less than human. And that's what an image is in the best cases. That's if you're watching like the best possible porn. And then of course, if that's what you're getting off to over and over again, and it's dark or misogynistic or horrible, you're actually wiring your body to get turned on by that more and more. And it's going to feel hard to get turned on by stuff. That's not that goes to browser, deletes history, clears cookies. <laughs> no. and I have compassion for the instincts to want to watch porn, right? Like I, I get where that comes from. And I think we can have this conversation without shaming anybody or shaming women watch porn too, but we know it's way more common oh, for yeah. men that the impulse to be around sexuality and to be around other humans having sex, like that's so natural. And we don't even talk about the fact that we're in this very unnatural, rigid sexual social experiment that's only been around very recently around long-term relationships where you're supposed to get everything out of your partner and desexualize society and all of that. Like men are craving this wild uninhibited sexuality. They're not getting it. Of course, they're going to watch porn. Yeah. And talking a bit, a bit about that, because I just got engaged a few or last month. And so now this is even more of a relevant conversation for me and thinking about long-term sexuality, what it means to get everything from one partner with the confluence of porn and Instagram and all this shit. And what does it mean? And how should a man navigate and sort through that? I and mean, we do have a 65% male audience. I think it's relevant. Definitely. What I have seen is that just having mainstream sex with the same partner always gets boring. There's no couple that escapes that. I don't escape that in my own five-year relationship. The only way for it to become interesting is to shift sex from being a formula of I touch you like this and we do this and we both hopefully come or whatever into who am I being when I show up sexually. And the reason that's so important is anything that fascinates us over the course of a lifetime is a question of who am I being when I do it. So to be an amazing athlete, you have to show up a certain way. 
to be an amazing artist, you have to show up a certain way to be an amazing mathematician or genius. It's who you're being, how you're expressing and how you're creating that makes you fall in love with your art or your craft for a lifetime. And we don't ever approach sex sexuality for the most part that way. Like, who am I being when I show up to have sex with my partner? And how do I open myself into a flow state? That's huge. So if sex becomes more akin to a flow state, it's more akin to personal development where issues can come up, thought patterns. You actually have a set of tools to integrate and evolve your sexuality with your partner. And beyond that, one of the reasons I love Tantra or BDSM or certain other sexual practices is they give you a kind of creative edge where you can create and explore these different dimensions to your sexuality. I'm personally much more drawn to Tantra myself, where you can explore with sexual energy and full body orgasms and like crazy, exciting, interesting things that make sex more like an art. And that allows it to be engaging over a lifetime. I have seen that to be the case, but we have very little sexual modeling like that. And so what people are left with, it just, there, there's no way for that not to get boring. So it's really about people taking responsibility for their sex lives and changing how they relate to it so that it becomes literally, it's like you're showing up to something that is engaging and exciting and interesting, not just because you're going to have an orgasm, but because of who it invites you to be every single time. That's, you know what, that makes me think about things in a much different way. And I, it just, it's so obvious that sex and developing your sexual side is part of personal development. And we spend so much time, at least a lot of the entrepreneurs I know, trying to work on ourselves and develop ourselves. And this is the untended garden. It's the unkept garden. Everything is going well. This doesn't really get addressed. And I'm wondering if this is something that that maybe some people are just naturally better at? Do you find that some people are more sexually talented and it becomes something they excel at, or do we all kind of start at a baseline? It's a good question. Some people are more, some people are more sexually inclined than others, but everybody is sexual. Some people are more naturally present in their body, something that makes someone sort of talented at being an athlete or talented people who are great at dancing and great at sports and stuff yeah. like that. There's something to that lends itself to being great at sex, but the actual, it, it is much more of a skill than people give it credit for. So sex can be learned just like anything else. And very few people are putting the time into mastering their sexuality and actually learning how to do it. And everyone's like, sex is natural. It's yeah. So is eating and being healthy. And if you don't pay any attention to what you're eating in the modern world, then you're not going to be healthy. It's the same with physical fitness is natural. And yet we all know that if you don't do anything about it in the modern world, you don't get to be healthy. So it's the same thing with sexuality. Sex is natural. And yet because the way that we do sex is so unnatural these days, it requires a level of attention and development to get to a place of mastery. And that is absolutely available to everyone. That makes total sense. And it makes it also a lot more attainable and not something that you should shame yourself about because if you don't feel like you're where you want to be sexually, it's something that you can actually and actively improve. Absolutely. And that's so missing. There's so much people just not talking about their marriages, not talking about their relationships, all of that, what's really going on and men and women feeling this incredible amount of sexual shame and what breaks my heart. And one of the things that means the most to me about the work I'm doing is people internalize that as there's something wrong with me. Like I'm broken. I'm unworthy. Nobody wants me, whatever it is that's going on. And I just see like, of course, people are not functioning well in a sexually broken society. So there's nothing wrong with anybody. This is the natural state of our bodies when we've experienced all this repression and weird sex education and no real tools about how to navigate our sexuality. So I love empowering people with actual tools that they can use to move out of whatever issues or problems they have. Talk to us about that because then you built a whole business around the, what you spent your entire life researching and developing and how did that roll out and how, did, how has that affected the world and what are you doing now? Yeah. So I started teaching um, almost 10 years ago now, and I decided to put it into an online business about four and a half years ago. So I just started creating uh, online courses 
and about my YouTube channel and things like that. And it just took off. It's been amazing. It's such a needed service to society. And I felt a lot of these things were being talked about in ways that weren't very modern and accessible to most people. And we've got online courses for men, women, couples, and certifications and things like that. And so it just, it blew up. And I love being able to make YouTube videos that people write in all the time and say, absolutely changed my life, has absolutely made a difference. It's cool. There's downsides to being in a taboo industry as an entrepreneur. You have to fight like stupid stuff, like Facebook's ad policies and Google can get upset sometimes and people get weird. But what's really rewarding about it is it's so needed. So that thing that entrepreneurs are always talking about of actually making a difference, it's very, you can, I can really see that every single day in this industry because it was just really in need of practical tools, thought out design, and people really having a conversation that could change their sexual experience and their relationship experience, which is so core to having a meaningful and fulfilling life. It's so true. And for anyone listening, I was talking to Layla just before we went live and I was joking with her about some of the crazy subject lines that come through in my inbox from her videos, which are amazing. <laughs> and you have this energy that just emanates from the fucking video. And I'm sitting here watching, I'm supposed to be like doing some something mundane. And I'm like watching a video on six exercises for your pussy. And my girlfriend's walking past and she's what are you doing? I'm like, nothing, just looking at this. I don't even have a pussy, but I'm curious. And uh, it's really, and you're one of the best out there. And your channel, if we could just like brag on you for a minute, your channel has really gotten big. So clearly people need it. Yeah, definitely. It's funny because we have 45 million views on our channel. And our people subscribe at lower rates because, you know, it's kind of intense yeah. to subscribe to a sexuality <laughs> channel. People are definitely watching. <laughs> yeah, it's not safe for work, but it's necessary. Yeah, and it's all YouTube, so, like, it's not super unsafe right. for work. But, like, I right. get that you don't want to open a pussy, a pussy headline <laughs> at work <laughs> sort of thing. Although I did have someone write in recently. Oh, gosh, what was it? I think I made a video on your vagina is more beautiful than you think. <laughs> and someone wrote in. She was like, I work at, like, a laser clinic or something like that. She's like, I called all my the people over and we watched the video and we were all crying together and I was like oh that's really cool do, do you get weird emails and messages because of kind of the space you're working in that's interesting less than I would have thought so back in the day three four years ago when I actually read all of my emails and stuff like that I would get hate mail and people saying weird things and I would cry and my <laughs> business partner he had been in advertising and marketing and he'd run like Pepsi Global's ad campaigns and stuff like that and he says look Pepsi gets more hate than you he's like you'd be surprised he's like everybody out there, any entrepreneur doing anything gets some amount of hate. Oh, There's yeah. no way to put yourself out in the world and not get it. And I actually get less than I would have thought. And, and I have you now team members and stuff filtering through it. I did have a breakthrough moment with an actual troll on YouTube. I usually don't really engage with them, but he was writing these like horrific, dark, scary things. And I wrote him like a three paragraph thing on my YouTube channel. And I was like, look, man, I was like, the thing that I see with like trolls and people that attack on the internet is they really try and do this thing where they hurt me or take down my power. And I'm like, the power differential in this is not lost on me. Like I'm out there putting things that I believe in out into the world every single day, feeling like I'm making a positive, empowering difference. And I love my business and you have nothing better to do on a Friday afternoon at 4 PM than write dirty, nasty things <laughs> on my YouTube channel. Yeah. I was like, I have been where I imagine you to be right now. And it is not a beautiful place. It is not too late to turn your life around. And he wrote back and he was like, I'm sorry, I'll stop. And I was like, Oh my God, I broke through to a troll. And he was right. Writing some horrific stuff. On now, my you, you're not supposed to feed the trolls. That's rule number one of internet business. Totally. I know. And it's been years since I interacted with a troll and something was supposed to happen. I was like, I just did the unthinkable. I had a breakthrough with my YouTube <laughs> troll. <laughs> Don't try to do it more than once. Yeah, guys, I'm not saying that's a great business practice, but that worked. <laughs> it's so interesting too. I was I was signing up for a, for a coaching program that I want to work on in the new year just to work on myself. And I was looking at different reviews of it online and it's so funny that it can have a hundred five star reviews and the five or six people who give it a one star with, by the reviews they leave, you can tell that everything that negative they're saying about the course or about the training is really just about them. Totally. You're just like, totally. oh, you just didn't want to, this isn't something you're willing to explore with yourself right now. Cool. Absolutely. You know? It's so important to recognize how much pain those people are in. Yeah, it's crazy. And also once you can realize that you're like, oh, it doesn't bother me anymore. That's great. Totally. Okay. So this is something that <laughs> just crystallizes. What's 
Obviously, LaylaMartin.com. Is that the same name for your YouTube channel? Yeah, Layla Martin. Okay. So we'll put it all in our show notes and we'll put it down in the email. Then what's a simple practice that people can take up today to get them on this path to becoming more in tune with their sexuality, whether they're male or female, and get them opened up a bit? Absolutely. So the simplest practice I can recommend is using connected breath during sex or masturbation. It can actually be easier to do it. Masturbating, self-pleasuring, I think is a way sexier word. Mm. Um, which is basically you breathe in through your nose or your mouth and you breathe out of your mouth and you don't pause between the inhale and the exhale or the exhale and the inhale. So it's called a connected breath and you're breathing a little deeper and a little faster than you normally would. And you do this the entire time that you are masturbating or the entire time that you're making love. Now, the reason this is so, it sounds so simple. And the reason it makes such a big difference is so much of the way that we control ourselves sexually, it comes from cortical control inside of our brains. And breath work is the fastest way that I've seen to take down cortical control and get someone into their somatic sensations and a connection within their body. Also, if you do this breathing and why I think it's better to try it solo first, if you have any issues, like we mentioned, people feel feel guilt, they feel fear, they feel shame, they feel all this stuff that's in there that we don't even know about. This breathing process actually helps release it. So you want to be a little bit careful because it can be a strong practice. If it starts to feel overwhelming or intense, just stop breathing and you'll be totally fine. And you don't want to do it if you've ever had epilepsy or any like serious health issues going on. But if you're cool and you don't have that going on, then this breathing practice can really open you up to much deeper sexual sensation, much deeper connection. And what it will really do is it will show you very instantly what's going on underneath the surface of your sexuality, which is really valuable. Everybody put down your phone and or computer right now <laughs> go to the bathroom no pornography self-pleasure connected breaths we're gonna do it at in unison tomorrow at 12 p.m pacific we're all yes. gonna be touching ourselves <laughs> i want you to think of me no actually don't think of me never mind that's gross Watch my this YouTube is the video. way to a better world yes oh lord I don't... before it gets dark layla thank you so much i love you thank you for being here it's been an absolute pleasure well, that is it for the Strength of Seduction podcast today, my friends. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to like and subscribe on whatever platform you are listening to us on and to leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Every review counts. If you are looking to get support with your marriage, if you're looking to grow in the intimacy, the communication, the health, and the finances that are holding your marriage up and you want to make them even stronger, go to strengthofseduction.com forward slash apply to learn more about Love and Legacy, our signature program for black married couples. Now, as I always say, my friends, love fiercely, communicate openly, and always find your way back to each other. This is Daniel. I'll catch you next time on the Strength of Seduction podcast. Peace.